Welcome to the Taylor Method for Pain-Free Living, a podcast that features enlightening conversations with experts in the medical field that helps to improve the health and well-being of those suffering from chronic pain due to injury. Learn from leading authorities the questions you should be asking to experience pain-free living. Hosted by father and son, Dr. Derek Taylor and Dr. Hudson Taylor, and joined by industry professionals in the health field, including doctors of integrative medicine and personal injury attorneys. Great. Welcome to the Taylor Method for Pain-Free Living. My name is Dr. Hudson Taylor, and we have Dr. Derek Taylor on today as well. Together, we're going to be discussing plantar fasciitis, what are some of the hidden causes, um, some of the inside scoop of what you need to know uh, to understand and better help your condition, and most importantly, um, what you can do to get on the right path to getting maximal improvement and with the ultimate goal of resolution in mind. Dr. Derek Taylor, what are your thoughts on plantar fasciitis? What do you have to say about it? Well, it's a pretty common condition. We see it in our office many times. People come in with pain at the bottom of the foot. Um, they A lot of times they come in with self-diagnosis because it's pretty easy to diagnose any pain at the bottom of the foot, especially when you've been sleeping all night and you first get out of bed and they have that, they, they first put pressure on that foot, that pain is excruciating at times. And um, after they've been on it for a period of time, it starts to loosen up some. And But then it just gets old after a while, because anytime you sit for any prolonged period of time and take pressure off of that foot, then when you get back on and do weight bearing again, that, that pain flares up. So we've seen it last for anywhere between a couple of weeks to a couple of years with some people. And even some people just have chronic plantar fasciitis that they just can't get rid of and that's when a lot of times they just they throw up the white flag and they say I surrender let's got to go see somebody for it but um, what are some of the common remedies that you've seen in the practice there the common remedies well home remedies that you see people trying to do oh the at-home remedies uh you know a lot of ice and heat and uh ibuprofen and yeah. then like uh, maybe some foot braces and or some inserts from happy feet, you know, or or some sort of foot support um, and uh, splints and, you know, kind of bandages and and just more medication. Yeah, we see a lot of people freezing water bottles and then rolling their feet on the water bottle. You ever hear that one there? People come oh, in yeah. And do yeah. That one. So it's all like temporary. Um, symptom relief, but it really doesn't do much to resolve the problem in and of itself. So because usually the problem is a little more complicated than rubbing some ice on it or yeah. You know, who who gets this? You know, who who have you seen with this this condition? Well it's usually seen in people that are, you know, middle age, they start to get a little bit older, body starts to break down. Um so people in their 40s, 50s, 60s and doesn't have to be that age, but that's what we commonly see. And then also people that um, are typically maybe that have slowly gained weight over the years. Um, they put more weight on. That's a lot more pressure on the feet um, when they start to add 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds onto their frame. It's just more than their load can handle. And then that, that will uh, contribute to plantar fasciitis. Uh, we mm. also <laughs> see people that uh, sometimes it's like acute trauma. We had a guy that came in, he recently, he jumped off of his boat trailer onto the, he thought he can just jump on the ground and he jumped on his, on the, on the asphalt, landed on his feet. And that just, that trauma itself triggered it. And traumatized it there. Comes into the office, you know, four or five months later and dealing with it, trying to resolve it on his own. Um, People with uh, overuse, they're runners. They're, mm. they're in the sport where they're running or jumping or they're playing pickleball or tennis. A lot of quick starts, stops, overuse, especially you combine that with middle age. Um, mm. And then uh, people whose diets aren't really super clean. They're eating inflammatory foods that have a lot of uh, foods that their body doesn't do well with, whether it's dairy or gluten or grains or 
alcohol or other things that are going to be causing inflammation within the joints there. Um, so those are some common factors that, you know, we see also just occupational people that are just constantly on their feet, um, that are constantly, it's, and it's overuse, but so funny. Why, why do you think that is when somebody there, they've been walking, let's say all their life and their occupation, then all of a sudden plantar fasciitis pops up. They always ask that, Hey, I've been doing this for the longest time. Why does it show up now? Yeah. What do, you, what do you think? How would you answer somebody that asked that question? Why, why is it showing up now? Yeah. I would just say, you know, there's, there's most likely some hidden things that have been really building up over the years, yeah. you know, and that uh, trauma or that fall or, uh, you know, jumping off the boat, that's, that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, you know, because, um, you know, plantar fasciitis, I mean, the scar tissue begins to develop in that plantar fascia, which is the tight bands of thick muscle or tendon starts to, to really develop in, in the fascia of the, of the plantar fascia. And that takes a lot of time to develop. It just doesn't happen overnight, you know? Yeah, so, sometimes they'll get a new pair of shoes, right? And they'll be, wow, they don't. Oh, yeah, it'll trigger it. Or they might have a new occupation or they start playing a new sport or they start to increase their workout mm -hmm. or they start to change their diet or their diet starts to go south. And then now next thing you know, the nutrients and the quality to those tissues aren't quite as well. Sometimes it's in a, a mental stress. They're going through a financial crisis or relational crisis and um, that kind of sets them off weakens the body puts it in a weakened state um, all these factors are influencing factors which hmm. cause plantar fasciitis sometimes it's you know you think about uh, women that are pregnant they have all these hormones that are being released this relaxing hormone and their extra weight gain plus the hormones Sometimes we'll see them come in with plantar fasciitis because of all the changes with pregnancy. And so number of different factors, that's where a good history comes in, finding out what were the things that tip that off, because they always mm -hmm. want to know, why am I having this now? Where did this come from? Yeah, you know, I just had a patient two weeks ago come in. She's an avid pickleball player. Actually, well, now she is, but she's only been about a month into playing pickleball. She was doing great for the first month of pickleball, playing like five times a week. Um, but the second she got a new pair of shoes and started wearing a new pair of shoes and playing pickleball, a month into it, all of a sudden her right heel exploded in inflammation. Her plantar fascia, plantar fascia became really, really tender, and her whole heel became red and inflamed and swollen. Uh, and it, was all, it was all triggered after the poor, the new shoes that were new but were not the right shoes for her feet. Right. Or, you know, sometimes, yeah, you're wearing a pair of shoes that you've been wearing for quite some time. Your body's gotten used to that. And now you have a new set of shoes with new mechanics and new new stressors and new changes in the angles of the shoes. And that can be enough to set things off. Also, with a lot of the shoe companies, especially New Balance. I love New Balance. Yeah, well, New Balance. About them, you got a you got a size B width, a size D, you got a size 2E, and you got a size 4E, which is mm -hmm. great. So you can really be um, really accommodating with the width. However, the problem that I don't like with, with just because it's New Balance, people say, I, I make a recommendation for New Balance and say, okay, that's a good shoe. But so they'll go to big five sporting goods and just get the cheapest pair of New Balance that's on sale. It's not the right model number. Mm -hmm. and that can create issues for them or you might get the right model number for example i for many years i've recommended like a 1080 uh model for the new balance however every like quarter they seem like they're changing the style and the model of the shoe you can't get that same shoe that they purchased like on january 1st you come mm -hmm. back in may and it's a completely it's a same model number but it's a different shoe altogether and you can't get the one that they really liked. So that can be a frustrating point. And so, and they mm. think, oh, I just got the same, I got a new shoe, it's still a 1080, but they don't realize that that 1080, they changed it up and now it's not the same. Maybe it's rolling more, it's, it's, it's shaped differently or they accommodated something differently. And so it's just, 
hmm. doesn't do well with their body and it's creating issues for them. So sometimes it can be tricky trying to find the key cause <clears throat> of that plantar fasciitis for patients. So just on the topic of shoes, if a patient uh, brought a pair of shoes into your office and wanted you to uh, give your advice on, hey, is this a good pair of shoes for me? What would you tell them or how would you evaluate that patient on a pair of shoes? Yeah, well, there's four things that I always tell a patient in regards to shoes. So what you want to do is you, like, for example, I just took my shoe off here. So when I push down here like this, it should bend more at the toe, at the, 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 the midsection of the toe box. Okay, now this is not the greatest shoe. It's bending more towards the middle. This isn't, you know, this shoe is a little bit worn. Um, when I first got it, it seemed to bend more towards the toe. But um, you you can look at that. The strength of that going this way, and this is more for like a for like a tennis shoe or a court shoe that I'm referring to. Um, it's hard of, harder to find that with the dress shoe, um, but you can go like that, push it in. The next thing you can do is twist it like this, and it should be somewhat firm. If it's like super flimsy, that's not going to get give your feet the support that you need. Next, you want to turn it over and look at the bottom and see, make sure that it's flat, so that it's got a flat bottom. It's not you know, doing one of these numbers where it's curved in like this and making their foot like they're on roller skates. Mm -hmm. And lastly, um, most important is you stand on your, stand on uh, one foot, close your eyes and see how you're balancing. You know, if you're all over the place, then that shoe's probably not going to be giving you the balance and stability that you need. And so you need something that's going to be giving you that kind of good support with that shoe, with that shoe um supporting your feet the way that it needs to be and if you get a good supporting shoe that'll not only just help your feet but mm. it's going to help your ankles your knees, knees your hips your back and everything else up above so it's really important that you get a good quality shoe and you can tell that right away right i mean when you evaluate a patient and and the goal is for them to feel too I mean, you should know right away if the shoe is a good fit or not, right? Because right, yeah. they're going to be strong, they're going to be balanced, and most yeah. importantly, they're going to feel they're going to feel really good when walking and when right uh, performing so we'll, on it, right? We'll tell them to buy the shoe. Make sure before you talk to the shoe person that you know you're going to go get it checked out by your chiropractor. So we'll have them buy the shoe, save the receipt. Don't wear the shoe. Just bring it to the office. We'll test them on it. There's a couple of different tests that we can do that in office that we do to test them to make sure that the shoe is going to be a right foot fit. Put the orthotic that we make for them inside the shoe. Um, you can do that with or without the sole that's already in the shoe. Kind of depends. Test it out. And if it's a fit, then great. If it's not a fit, we have them go back to the shoe store, return that shoe, and get a different model or a different mm -hmm. pair. That's going to be. What would you say to patients who get plantar fasciitis and then they want to get a pair of inserts, you know? Yeah. Well, inserts are huge. One of the biggest causes of plantar fasciitis, in our opinion, is having arch the arches in your feet compromised to some, some degree, whether you're either overpronating or they're oversupinating. So they're either going to have a really flat feet, flat foot, or their arches can be even too high. That that in itself can cause uh foot mechanic abnormalities that will increase the development of plantar fasciitis on somebody. So we have, uh, in both offices, we have a three-dimensional uh, foot scanning capability that you can take a look at all three arches in the feet. There's three arches in the feet. There's the medial longitudinal arch, the lateral longitudinal arch, and the anterior transverse arch. I'm trying to see if I have a picture of that handy here with me to show our listeners mm, I don't but uh, you have the three arches there and we can see which arches are being collapsed based upon this foot scan and then from there you can custom make an orthotic that will cut that will support all three arches and not only going to be helping with the feet but also spinal pelvic stabilizers that are going to help the pelvis, the hips, and the lower back, uh, which is very important. Our, our, our orthotics are designed to help uh, everything from the ground up. So that's mm -hmm. what I love about them. And the other thing I like about them is that they're a softer 
flexible orthotic as opposed to a hard plastic. There's two philosophy camps in regards to orthotics. You can get the plastic hard orthotic, um, uh, or you can get one that's going to be flexible, more moldable, and accommodating to the foot. And I like that one, which is the one that we use just because it's more natural in the sense when it's plastic mm. and hard, it's almost like a cast is on the foot and that's going to put an extra strain on the uh, ankle and the knees and the back um, as a result. So just a different philosophy. I mean, podiatrists have been using plastic um, orthotics um, for eons. And so I just like ours because they're flexible and they're more accommodating to the pelvis and hip along with the foot yeah you know and and with the orthotics uh it's like a wrong pair of orthotics number one it's not going to help the plantar fasciitis condition if you get it so if you if you have plantar fasciitis and you get a pair of orthotics and you don't notice any positive change whatsoever then you should remove the orthotic immediately because you know you have the risk of damaging the plantar fascia even more. And then number one, if you start to develop plantar fasciitis and you're wearing a pair of orthotics, it's like you may want to reevaluate those pair of orthotics that you're wearing because chances are it's not supporting your arches correctly, right? Because mm -hmm. you do have you do have three arches. You don't just have one on the in on the inside. Right. You know, and um and yeah. uh, you know if you think about it, when the pla plantar fascia becomes painful, that usually means that it's really inflamed, you know, and if it's really inflamed, usually that means that there may be some micro tears going on or some sort or damage inside the, inside the plantar fascia. And so having a cast orthotic or a hard plastic one, I mean, you're setting up your plantar fascia, be, plantar fascia to become even more damaged. Mm -hmm. So foot, foot shoes and, and orthotics are just extremely, extremely important. Yeah, it's really important. I, I've seen people that come in with, uh, you know, the plastic orthotics from the podiatrist and they have plantar fasciitis. And when they wear that, it does take strain off of the plantar fascia. It does bring us a, a, a sort of relief to that area. I've, I've, I've often seen that. So, you know, to give credit to the podiatrists that are out there, they, it is, um, it, I've seen it at, beneficial for taking some of the strain off, but I'm looking at the whole picture here, not just strain off of the foot, but then also mm. making sure that that orthotic is going to be designed to help balance out the lower back and pelvis. And you've seen it in your practice, I'm sure, um, where somebody's coming in with pain in the bottom of the foot, but it's not necessarily coming from the foot. It's due to imbalances seen in the calf muscles, the gastrocnemius, the soleus, even the quads, quadriceps, mm. or glutes or hips, right? I mean, uh, everything above that can influence um, uh, the, the feet. Problems in the hips can cause uh, you to walk differently in the feet and vice versa. Mm. It goes both ways. And so uh, that's why it's good to have something that's going to help both the feet and the hips, in my opinion. Mm. Have you ever seen that with people who have had maybe uh, hip replacements or knee replacements and they also develop plantar fasciitis afterward? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I just had a lady come in yesterday. She comes in. She had, she came in on one, three days ago. She came in three days ago. Um, she had a lot of pain down the leg um, in a, you know, in regards to, it was causing sciatica, causing low mm. back pain. And she says, I have, um, uh, I have stenosis. Are you able to help? And I told her right off the bat, look, if your stenosis is severe, then, you know, you, you're just dealing with the physical restriction of that spinal cord on the canal. So, you know, I'm not, you're more likely to get benefits if you come in and your central canal stenosis is more mild to moderate. So I try to just, I just try to give her a realistic picture of that look, don't, don't be super hopeful if you have bad stenosis and uh, you're hoping for us to, to resolve this here for you. And so she started, uh, you know, crying there at the, at the consultation saying, I, I, 
I don't want to go through a surgery. And this is, this is so somebody referred her and another therapist referred her to her office. And she was like, this was kind of like my last hope here. And so I just felt bad for her. And I said, okay, well, let's do this. Let's put you on some therapy and let's just see how you respond. You know, um, let's, uh, that way there's no, you know, there's, let's just try it, see what happens. So we did some yeah. therapy on her and um, like the next day she had, I mean, right after she was done with the therapy, she had significant relief. And two days later, she called and said, I've had significant relief here the past two days. I want to move forward and like do an evaluation. So we did our evaluation. Well, it's found out that uh, when we took a history of this, uh, we found out that all her symptoms started after the hip replacement surgery. Oh. She said, the doctor said my hips are perfectly aligned. And so the hips might have been aligned, but, you know, you're going to have some biomechanical changes there. Um, even the slightest, even a millimeter change difference can start to cause aggravation to the back, which can cause sciatica, which can cause the plantar fasciitis and foot problems just because you're walking a little bit differently. So here's the thing. I told her, look, you responded well with some minimal therapy here, and it's been like that for two days. What if, because uh, severe spinal canal stenosis doesn't happen overnight, right? That takes decades. Right. To yeah. So here for decades, you just started having yeah. the, the symptoms a, a few months after, uh, you know, a few months ago after having the hip replacement surgery. Prior to that surgery, you weren't having any of these issues. So what if we can get you balanced? prior to the was prior to the um surgery and so she came in we did a full workup we did all our therapies on her using the taylor method night and day difference huge change she was before when she walked up the stairs she had to take a step and then bring the other one up take a step bring the other one she said after one oh, wow. treatment she said she was able to walk normally and that's what happens when you start to get the body balance. We just made some orthotics for her that are going to have a three millimeter lift on that right side. The doctor said it was perfectly even, but when you looked at the iliums, the ilium was a little bit off. The sacrum was tilted. The femur had heights there where this, that was balanced, but the rest of the pelvis in relation was not balanced. And that's what we are as, as mm. doctors of chiropractic. We're biomechanical experts. That's what our forte is. We, we, we're, we don't do surgery. We don't do injections. We don't know how to do that stuff, but we do know how to balance the body out. So when we balance that body out, we put a we put a makeshift lift in there temporarily to try it out, and she noticed a huge shift. So I think we're going to be able to get her to where she was and avoid have her avoid the surgery altogether, just because you're getting things balanced out. And the same would ring true if it were a case for plantar fasciitis. How many times have you uh, seen somebody with plantar fasciitis and you had to work on uh, the lower extremities or the pelvis, or they needed an adjustment or some of these other factors. It's not just the foot alone. You got to look at it as a whole kinematic chain. When you do that, that makes the biggest difference. Mm. So would you say that some of the common imbalances of plantar fasciitis are maybe number one, the arches of the feet, and then also the balance of the, of the, in the alignment of the knees, and then the alignment of the hips too? Yeah, I think those are huge. Also, one thing that I haven't mentioned is just um, just their sh their shoes altogether. Just in people wearing the improper footwear, right? Improper footwear. Yeah, you know they're wearing their shoes. What do you see? You see people wearing their shoes too big or too tight in your practice? Well, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of both, but more, mainly it's uh, too tight. Yeah, they're they they go to the shoe salesman. And they says, "Okay, you're a size ten, and so they get a shoe that's a size 10. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, and so, and for women, they don't want to look like they have big feet. So they get shoes that are smaller to kind of cram their feet. It's almost like the yeah. ancient Chinese foot binding principle where they have, where their, their feet are crunched in there. That messes up all the proprioception. All the proprioceptors are in the feet. All your balance centers are off. It, it scrunches that and causes uh, issues in there, such as plantar fasciitis, because their shoe wear is too tight. They're not, and it's not the right kind of shoe. And if right. they're working in a dress shoe or heels and they're wearing that all day long, what happens when that heel is up? You know, what's that going to do to the mechanics and to the stretching out of that plantar fasciitis? Oh, yeah. And then so their footwear and they're, and they're wearing shoes that are putting stress not just on the feet, but the knees and the back and everything else. So wearing the right shoe. Yeah. Critical. 
having their feet checked for their arches you know as we as we age a lot of times we have a, a uh, an arch that starts to fall and that's like an acquired foot drop some people or it's a congenital foot drop they just uh their feet are con congenitally flat they were born that way and they just have flat feet and you know having that those orthotics in there can really make a difference they may not have had a problem all their life but now they're getting older, the tissues are starting breaking down, they've gained a little bit of weight, they're eat, they're cheating on their diet, they're not eating quite as well. And on top of that, they're exercising more. It's like a perfect storm to cause plantar fasciitis. So if you can nip some of these things in the butt early on, you can really prevent it altogether and then resolve it. So balance, so proper footwear and orthotics, balance out the hips, the pelvis, the feet, the arches, the knees as best as you can. Um, and then, and then the second, the other thing I wanted to bring up was, okay, well, what about in the formation of a heel spur, right? The, um, patient comes in, they got an x-ray and they see this big heel spur on the bottom of their heel. Right. right? And, and it's right where the, it's close, really, you know, it's right where the pain is. So. Right. Yeah. You know, well, what happens is their, their plantar fascia is too tight. Here's the calcaneus, the plantar fascia attaches onto that and it's too tight. And so it pulls off the bone. The body in response lays down more calcium to protect that, that, that plantar fascia from ripping off of the bone. And so it lays down more calcium to protect it. And then what happens over time, you just have a development of a heel spur. And then when they walk, that heel spur jabs into the bottom of the, into the ground, causing that pain. So a lot of times they'll go to podiatrist and they'll put like a donut pad in there to kind of, to, absorb some of that shock and take some of that pressure off. But uh, if you can use some technology to take pressure off of that area there, break that up in that area and take the scar tissue off, get the right shoe and work on the other areas of the body to get it balanced out. Even with the heel spur, you can have, you can see pain be completely eliminated if you get that right and you treat it properly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I had a lady with plantar fasciitis for uh, multiple decades, and um, she had a history of, uh, you know, extensive weight training all her life and using her feet a lot. Well, she developed heel spurs and uh, and both feet worse on the right side, um, and a lot of arthritis in the in the feet and a lot of scar tissue in the feet. And um, you know, once we were able to break through with the scar tissue, a lot of the inflammation was was taken away. You know, and it made me kind of think, you talked about treating the lady with stenosis and your other plantar fasciitis patients. What, are, what do you try to accomplish in your treatments uh, for, for, for this? And, and, and if someone were to come in with plantar fasciitis, what would you try to accomplish in your treatments? For that? Well, you know, a lot of times, like I think of about, a, um, uh, I've had a, I had a lady that yeah, all she wanted to do is just be able to go for a walk with, in the neighborhood with her husband. She missed that time. That was her exercise time and that was her connecting time with her husband. So um, she was overweight. She was in her 60s. She had been dealing with this for years. And so we had to modify her diet. We had to work on those areas for the heel spur. We had to ba ba balance the body out with adjustments and treatment. And then um, she got on our plan. She lost 20 pounds easily over, you know, in about six weeks. And after six weeks of care, zero pain went from an eight to a zero in no time. And now she's out walking. She was out walking with her husband again, and she's getting her back like life back to normal. So one of the first immediate short-term goals is just getting them out of pain where they can get up in the morning and stand up without any pain in their heels. That's one of the, you know, the first things or being able to go for their walk. So it all depends on what their goals are and what they're trying to accomplish, you know? Other people, they're running marathons or they're running uh, 5Ks or they're a triathlete. So they, that's a little bit more challenging. They have, they're constantly stressing. So you got to look at the right shoe. You got to get them the orthotic. You have to work intensively on breaking that stuff, but they can have great success as well. And so it's yeah. just a matter of finding out what the cause is and a, a test, a, addressing it. And your immediate short-term goal is to get out of pain, but then the long-term goal is then the moving to wellness, being at the ideal weight, eating the right foods, and staying pain-free, just with a little easy upkeep and maintenance to keep things moving and heading in that right direction. 
What would you say are two of the most common foods that, ca that can contribute to plantar fasciitis? Well, I would probably say um, a lot of these things. People have issues with dairy and gluten, you know, that's big. Mm -hmm. uh, too much sugar is another. Um, alcohol, sometimes coffee. So um, grains in general. Soy uh, too, huh? Food. What was that? Soy, you ever seen soy contribute? Yeah, soy is an, an issue, Never but you know, um, it kind of depends on the nationality there with that. I mean, uh, they're, um, so, but you're, it just all depends. That's why it's best to do like some food testing uh, to figure out which foods are specifically causing that and just asking them what are they eating in their diet that's sabotaging their health. And a lot of times it's the stuff they think is healthy for them. Mm. You know, I eat oatmeal every morning for breakfast. Well, <laughs> I have fruit every morning for breakfast. Isn't that good? No, you know, right. A lot of sugar, oats, or uh, that can be inflammatory for them. So, you know, it's the things that, that they need, they're eating that needs to be addressed. And it's easy just to test those things and get them on the right path. Yeah. So when you say that you, um, you know, you, you, you treat a patient or a, a help to, to get, you know, you said the first step sometimes is just get, get the pain relieved, get them out of pain. Right. So, you know, what's this, what's the secret to getting someone out of pain uh, with, with plantar fasciitis in your office? Yeah, as far as, uh, you know, like what's the, what's the principle behind getting someone out of pain? Is well, it like, you know, you know, decreasing the inflammation or, you know, increasing the blood flow or well, what would you say? I think the number one thing that a lot of people miss is just finding out what's causing it in the first place. So doing okay. a proper examination and history and figuring out what caused it in the first place. What was it that brought yeah. them into the office or you got to do your due diligence and finding out what that is and doing a thorough exam to figure out and pinpointing exactly where to work. So a lot of times if somebody will go to, they have plantar fasciitis, they'll see a doctor, they'll take a brief history and they'll immediately start working on the foot. Well, sometimes not you know, treating the right area. They're not treating the right area. And that's where we, the yeah. tailor method comes in to figure out and identify exactly where to work first to start taking some pressure off of that foot. So what would you say to someone who look, you know, they've, they've tried it all. And, or, you know, they, they tell, they come and tell you, look, I've tried it all. I've, you know, I have tried many different types of footwear and I've tried the orthotics and, you know, um, I've gotten adjusted to get my hips aligned. And, um, you know, I've tried all these things, you know, and, um, at that point, what else, what else could be an, another hidden cause of plantar fasciitis? Let's say that everything is balanced as good as possible and they're wearing the right shoes and they're wearing the right orthotics but they still have the pain and they're even eating the right foods are there any other hidden causes of plantar fasciitis that that you address and that you see well on to that two there's two th different things that you mentioned a lot of times they say they've done everything and they tried it but oftentimes they've done it on their own they're they're reading okay. stuff on google and the internet they, okay they went to these different doctors and they're not specifically testing for the food they're yeah. not doing this. They're not. They're not, they're not using. Um, uh, there's adjust. Getting adjustments is different from like getting adjusted exactly where you need to be adjusted. Having right. muscle work done is different than breaking up the scar tissue exactly where what's causing the pain in this particular area. Right. Okay. Okay. And so, right off the bat. Um, First of all, if they say, well, I've tried everything and there's nothing that you can do to help, I'll probably say to them, yeah, well, if you're you're doubtful uh, that this is going to be helpful, then I don't really like to have, we don't like to treat people that come in where I'm trying to have to convince them. They're already yeah. convinced in their, their mind. Maybe their spouse drug them in. Hey, when you're ready to, to let me or let us do our work on you and do it the way that we know how to get rid of this pain for you then let us know. But when they're trying to fix it themselves at the same time that you are, I've often found that that's not been successful. You know, they're getting treatment at your office and they're trying this therapy and they're trying this here as well, which kind of undoes mm -hmm. what we do. If we can just do our method of madness of how we resolve these issues and take out and remove the layers of onions and peels of 
scar tissue that has developed over the decades and getting them on the right plan over yeah. time they they will see success they it, you know it may take time but they got to trust the process but if they're not willing to do that then they're probably not a good candidate for our office but let's uh -huh. say they are then it's just a matter of getting them on the right adjustments working on right. the right tissues using the right technology and the right timing and losing the weight at the same time getting on the right eating plan getting in the right shoes and the right orthotic even creating customizing making the orthotic um sometimes that's a trial and error getting them in the right pair as far as you know working these those things out as far as maybe heel lifts or no heel lifts and so it's a it's a pretty it can be a pretty complex issue because it's a complex yeah. condition sometimes so uh, mm -hmm. I would say that and then in regards yeah. to if they tried everything else and it's not just there's some you just got to keep digging there's some other hidden factor that's causing that that has not been addressed yet and what would you say to a patient who and this is on the topic of scar tissue you know let's say you have a patient who comes in and and they know that they have scar tissue in their plantar fascia and they said look i've gotten massages on my feet you know i've gotten massages and in some cases it doesn't didn't help or made it worse or it got temporary relief you know i've tried addressing the scar tissue but what you know what would you what advice would you give them on on how to properly address scar tissue and how it may be contributing to plantar fascia you always have to be working in the right area okay. the right scar tissue so if you have let's say here's your heel and the pain is right here that pain is caused by a scar tissue someplace in the body that's super specific so let's say it's over here in the cap if you're that's the area of the pain yeah nine times out of ten when they go to the practitioner they're going to be rubbing that area if the area painted or our job is finding using the tailor method to figure out exactly where that's coming from in this case it may let's say it's over here or let's say it's over here we work on this area we found the idea we identify the area that needs to be addressed at number one and number two using the right technology to to clear that that may okay you know, we have we have a number of different technology that we use to resolve that and yeah. it's just a matter of finding the right one with the right pulses or the right frequency or the right hertz that's going to resolve that. You, and the more specific you are, the better results you're going to get. Can you break up and permanently get rid of scar tissue? Yes, you can make huge changes. The permanent scar tissue breakup is going to need technology. But understand, okay. just because you, you make a huge shift and resolve that area, they can always be, unless you correct the overall biomechanical issue, they can be creating new scar tissue just with their daily activities of daily living or the exercises that they're doing. So you have to address yeah, those. Put them on too. the right. Put them on the right. right. Plan. Yeah. And would you say that sometimes the problems they had is due is, or would you say that sometimes the, the plantar fasciitis they've had is due to layers of scar tissue that are so deep and so thick that it's yeah, it's not in just one layer of scar tissue you're dealing with, but you're dealing with layers and layers because what happens, here's the, here's the normal oh. tissue, you create the scar tissue, right? It's not resolved mm -hmm. properly. And then it just, you keep re-tearing it and then you just build up layers and layers. So you'd remove the first layer on their first visit, they're already feeling 20% better, but then you got to get down to that bottom layer and keep it like that mm -hmm. in order for that pain to go away altogether. So sometimes you got to, you have to take the scar tissue the level of depth a really deep level of treatment right. it's just that's it's the way it takes time it takes time sometimes you can be fortunate and just remove a layer or two and that's enough and it's to it take the edge off and the pain is gone but more times than not then you have to really get down to the bottom layers to get longer lasting permanent type results got it and uh last question here for you and maybe we can conclude on this how long does it take to for someone to get vast improvement or to become pain-free with plantar fasciitis a lot of times the longer that they've had the condition the longer it takes to resolve right uh -huh. so that's why early intervention is important as soon as they start to feel that the sooner they get in the faster they're going to get faster results they're going to get the longer they wait what happens the more complex it becomes the more compensations occur in the body and the longer it takes to resolve that so it just all mm -hmm. depends on how long they've had it and uh the mistake that people make is they, this, they say those dangerous words, uh, maybe this thing will go away with time, you know, this thing will eventually go away. And, and now it's been two, two months, three months, two years, three years, still not going away. Hey, I got to, 
But this at that point, it's become so much more complex. It just takes, you can still get there. It's just going to take sometimes longer. And it's it's more intensive care to get to that place where they're at the place where they want to be. Mm, got it. Well, very good. Um, are there any other closing thoughts at all? No, no. Yeah. I, I think uh, the other thing is just drinking more water. People need to drink more water, I think, is always important. But plantar fasciitis mm. is a tough one. It's not always easy to resolve them. Um, a lot of times it's because people just, they, they, they suffer with it for so long. They start to compensate and just becomes more ugly and more complex. But there is hope out there. There's a lot that can be done for it naturally without surgery. Mm. Got it. And the last thing you know, I would say too is um, definitely uh, check out check out our book uh, that we wrote on foot pain. There's a chapter in there on plantar fasciitis, and you know, with some pictures, it may help you understand uh, kind of the anatomy behind it a little bit more and and the reason why these things happen. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed all the information today and Dr. Taylor's experiences on plantar fasciitis. I would just I would also just say, look, just start start. Uh, Start re researching these things and maybe taking some of the tips you learned today and start applying it now. Uh, by the time you you go in to see Dr. Taylor or you know whatever you do to get your plantar fasciitis resolved, you're gonna have better chances for success if you're eating properly and hydrating. I would just say that too. Yeah. Start and start have... e eating as well as you can and hydrate as well as you can. Start cleaning up the 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 diet on the inside and that's gonna help your recovery a, a lot. Right. And there's two offices to serve you. If you're on the West Coast, you can go to the Los Angeles Torrance office at, or with Dr. run by Dr. Hudson and then for myself here in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. So either one would be great to see you. Give our office a call. Maybe if you're someplace and else where we can maybe point you in the right direction. But it's been a fun show. Thanks for the interview Absolutely. and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. And we'll talk soon. Thank you for listening to the Taylor Method for Pain-Free Living podcast. For more information about the Taylor Method and how you can find lasting pain relief, visit www.drderektaylor.com. That's www.drderektaylor.com.